Welcome to the Best Music Podcast, where we see behind the curtain and discover the hidden habits and success secrets of noteworthy music makers. I'm your host, Dan Spencer, and this week's featured guest is Joe Denenson. Joe Dennison has been hailed by critics as the Jimi Hendrix of the violin because of his innovative style on, get this, a seven-string electric violin. Joe has worked with The Who, 50 Cent, Sheryl Crow, Bruce Springsteen, Phoebe Snow, Everclear, Richie Blackmore, Smokey Robinson, Aretha Franklin, Les Paul, <gasps> and as a soloist with a New York City ballet, Jazz at Lincoln Center. If that's not an impressive CV, I don't know what is. Joe is a lead singer and electric violinist for the progressive rock band Stratospheres, which has released five critically acclaimed CDs. A BMI Jazz Composers Grant recipient and winner of the John Lennon Songwriting Contest, he's written over 200 string quartet solo pieces for violinist Rachel Barton Pine and sits on the board of advisors for composers now. His original music has been featured on, get ready for another impressive list here, people, CMT, <laughs> MTV, VH1, Comedy Central, National, Geogra National Geographic, excuse me, and the Travel Channel. <coughs> now, Joe's latest offering with Rachel Flowers on flute and piano <coughs> and Alex Skolnick on guitar is a cover of Chick Corea's classic, Spain. Uh, on the upcoming Joe Denison and Stratosphere's box set, double CD and Blu-ray behind the curtain live from Prague stock links to this awesome video and performance. And obviously the Blu-ray and double CD eventually are going to be in the description. If you are on video and show notes, if you're an, if you are on audio, excuse me, you can check out more at Joe Denins com. that's J O E D E N I N Z O N Joe. Thanks so much for taking time to hang out with me today. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's uh, anytime someone reads my whole bio to me, I get really embarrassed. It's like <laughs> hide under a desk or something. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, man, I don't know what to say after that, but thank you for having me. It's, it's great talking to you this morning and uh, appreciate you featuring the music. You know. 100%. Yeah. Uh, so Joe, uh, what we do here, as I'm sure you uh, figured out from our emails back and forth, is we're trying to figure out what you've done really well in your career so far and also figure out the mistakes you've made so we can all learn from your successes mm. and your mistakes and mm. move the conversation about what it means yeah. to be a music maker forward into the future. So let's start with some lifestyle things, some basic self-care things. So what's the number of hours of sleep you need to feel no negative impact on your performance and creativity the next day? Six. I would six. say, yeah, if after six, um, although I've been known to, to do okay with five, but, but <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I would say six is a safe answer. I, I'm lucky to get that, <laughs> hmm. but, but I shoot for it, you know. Yeah, you, you, you are a busy guy for sure. Have you ever tried using mindfulness or meditation to impact either your performance or your creativity? You know what I do? I run. Uh, uh, that that uh, I did it this morning right, right before talking to you and it helps clear my head and help me focus on the day and that's kind of – I get in, into a meditative state when I do that. I'm a distance runner, you know. Sure. So how do people in your life around you support your ability to make music and be creative? Well, I have my little musical man cave uh, where I'm sitting right now where I write and record and it's kind of my refuge from the world. So they allow me to spend many hours in here very graciously. You know, I would say too many hours because, you know, I, I want to spend more time with my kids and my wife. But uh, but here I am. <laughs> That's know? awesome. I have a, it's good to have a place where you go in your house where you can, you know, just create and shut out the world and just focus. And you create an energy in that in that space, I think, that it's also I've read that it's it's important to have have it be this a consistent place where you go and, and do your thing whatever that thing is you know yeah they, they talk a lot about productivity and like you say creating an energy or or a a continual um, input into your um, into your neural pathways of when I'm in this space I feel creative I am working I am focused and when yeah. you have that reaffirmed then it, it, it can it can turn into really cool things so 
Let's talk a little bit about success because success can be measured by many different metrics, but how do you define success for yourself? There's so many different <clears throat> metrics. You're right. Um, I mean, there's the su- there's making a living as a musician. That's a success. Um, but you can make a living as a musician, you know, playing in orchestra pits, playing weddings, teaching. It could be any and all of those things, which is fine. But for me, above that is making a living as a musician, playing creative music, mm. whether for yourself or, or with others. And especially if you if you're making a complete living playing your creative music that you write, that's to me the brass ring. I, I I'm not there yet, you know, but. Um, some people are cool just being the side man or the side woman and, and that's okay. But other people need to sc- scratch that creative itch and express themselves. Um, I, I'm one of those people. I have to have an outlet for, for my voice. I feel like I have something to, to share with the world and I need to say, express it. You know, um, I just feel compelled to, to create and, and do my thing. So I, I try to carve out a space for that in my life. Um, and of course I would love for that to be the only thing I, I do or, you know, a, a bigger chunk of my income, so to speak. Um, but that's the goal. Yeah. So it's v- different metrics of success for sure. So do you think of yourself as a musician, a human who plays music or something else in terms of your self identity? Uh, well, I would say musician, you know, but that's, that's what I am professionally. You know, I'm also a father and a husband. So, you know, that's, all three of those things. You know? <laughs> what but, would your number one piece of advice be for anyone who is trying to do music in terms of achieving goals? Because clearly, to get to the place where you are, <laughs> you have achieved many of the goals that you've set for yourself. I would say, um, don't listen to naysayers. Follow your heart. Put, put in the work and be ready to sacrifice time and, and money, especially if it's something you, you really believe in that you, that you want to do. Um, you know, try to find a balance between, you know, personal life, family, friends, and, and professional life, which is hard because mm-hmm. sometimes when I get really busy, it just eats me alive and I, I have no time for anything else or anyone else. Uh, it's a feast or famine kind of business. You know? mm. um, so it's challenging. I'm still working on that. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, um, reiterating what I said before, carve out a a piece of your life where you could be creative and uh, do what you want to do. And what's the number one mistake around achieving goals that you've learned to avoid in your career and in your life? I think it's the way you interact with people. You know, you can get um, the same results with, you know, while also respecting people and mm. um it's the way you the way you um present yourself the way you exchange ideas and the way you just respect colleagues and that you work with regardless of your personal opinions of their music or or anything else you know there's a certain the, the second thing actually if you're providing a service for somebody if you're an artist and i guess this could apply to any career you have to compartmentalize this is the kind of gig where I, I might not like what I'm doing creative artistically, but I want to make this, these people happy mm. because I respect these people. Mm. Um, and I respect myself enough not to phone it in or do a half ass job. <sighs> That's um, huge. And That's then, huge. and then compartmentalize when it's, when it's your project, you know, um, and recognize the difference and don't mix those two. Cause then you're just going to be a bitter person <laughs> <you know? laughs> and you're not going to get hired. So, Let's talk a little bit about practice, Joe. Do you have a time or times of day that you like to practice? Well, the, the safest time is the morning because my kids are at school. My wife is at work most of the time and I, I'm alone in the house and it's can hear a pin drop. So it's, <laughs> it's my time to focus and, and get my stuff done. And, you know, later on in the day, things get crazy. I got to run to a gig or, you know, I got to do something with the kids. There's no time to really sit still. Right now, how are you dividing your practice time? It's really project oriented. Uh-huh. It depends on what I have coming up. I mean, mm-hmm. last week um, I was doing this concert with my with uh, the Who and then Sweet Plantain, my string quartet, 
um, with James Carter and uh, Curtis Stewart. So I had to work on that music. Then I had to learn music for four different bands at Prague Stock that I was playing with. <laughs> That's a so, lot of fans. So that was my my <laughs> focus that week. This week I'm I'm working on Renaissance uh, music because I'm we're touring with Renaissance starting next week, and I'm the concert master. So I have to get all that music together for the strings and be in touch with the music director for any corrections. Um, and also still, you know, finding little mistakes on our, um, well, that's not practicing. It's just work, but work, it, like yeah. the live DVD stuff. And I go through periods where I don't practice much. Hmm. If I, there's business things or promotion things that I'm focused on, you know, it's practicing is a different thing than it was for me when I was in my twenties, for example, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so when you were in your 20s and you were, I, I'm assuming, practicing the most in terms of volume you practiced in your life, what yeah. was like your maximum hours per day you were putting in? I th think six to eight hours. That's significant, yeah. Um, although I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no, <laughs> neither would I. <laughs> because like it's a myth. I tell people, man, I was, uh, you don't really have to practice six hours uh -uh. a day because after about three, you get physically and mentally uh -huh. tired. Um, and, and you stop focusing, yes. you start zoning yes. out. I'd, I'd rather like a focus two or three hours and then, you know, work on your social media, build, build up your brand or, you know, make some calls to get some gigs. Yes. Go, go out for a beer with, with, with somebody or, or live. you know, live or network, whatever. Yes. That's also part of your practice regimen. Cause there's many ridiculously talented people with mad chops that are sitting in their rooms that no one's going to hear. Because they didn't do those other things, they just practiced all the time, you know. And you, you you have to kind of water all parts of the garden, so to speak, you know. What do you think your number one piece of advice for practicing, for it, regardless of instrument, would be? Budget your time, prioritize what you need to do, and also leave time to be free. Leave time to uh, just jam. Mm. Uh, like you have the discipline, kind of thoughtful, analytical practicing, and then the creative practicing where you're just spewing and, and creating <laughs> something and not ju not super judging yourself, you know, because especially this, this is this exists with classical musicians because I come from a family of classical musicians and from an, uh, I grew up around classical cats and they're wired very differently. And there's this emphasis on perfection and, you know, do exactly what your teacher says and you're not allowed to have an opinion until you're 22 mm. <laughs> about music, you know. Um, and as a result, there's this constant second guessing yourself and fear of making a mistake and fear of making a sound in front of anybody that's not super rehearsed all the, you know, to death. And that's, that's a horrible, uh, mental state to be in, mm. you know, um, and I, it's sorry if I'm rambling, but I'll give you an example there. I had, um, my wife's in the New York Philharmonic and we had a party at our house and I invited my friend who is uh, like an Italian gypsy percussionist and she does drum circles and just these jam sessions. And she was passing out tambourines to people. And uh, it was a weird mixture of people <laughs> and everybody. And in most situations like that, where we'd get into these drum circle jam sessions that would last all night, everybody would be cool and just playing, even if they barely play, you know, yeah. could play an instrument. Everybody in this social group just froze <laughs> like, like a deer in the headlights. And Oh my God, you know, I can't do that. So, but doesn't Joe, doesn't that also tie into the fact that a lot of that classical way, the thing it's set up is you're with this community and you're hired for sometimes a lifetime position. And it's almost like I, I empathize with that experience because you, you don't want to look even in a moment like you are incapable or bad or uh, uh, not proficient in some way. I agree with you about the mindset, but I think too, because the system is set up in such a way where you have sometimes these lifelong relationships with these musicians and you're, and you're trying to maintain that professionalism. Uh, and again, to your point, it's a, it's a particular kind of professionalism, right? Well, you you touched on something important. It's being afraid to look bad in front of your colleagues. Yeah. Because you think everyone's judging you. Yes. But as a person who studied jazz and classical music in, in college, you know, classical music is about the pursuit of perfection. And improvised music is about uh, seizing a uh, mistake as an opportunity. Yes. yes. So taking what you would perceive as a mistake and turning it into gold. Yeah. Um, 
and try, delving deeper into that. And, and, and it's kind of a psychological process of self-acceptance. Mm. Ooh. Um, you know, whatever comes out of me is okay because it comes from me. It's, <sighs> it's genuine, you know. And I think in a typical upbringing for a classical musician, you miss out on that. Hmm. And if, if, even if your goal is to play an orchestra or be a classical soloist, I think to have that part of your brain developed is important mm. just for your psychology and recognizing that if you're at a party where you're not at an audition, you can let loose and not worry about being judged. Uh, and so it's something I've, I've kind of come around to over the years that, you know, I'm not, I don't think negatively of anybody. I just wish, you know, certain people had that experience mm. and were able to um, work on that, that part of their psyche, you know? What do you think the number one mistake you've learned to avoid in practicing? Do you think it's really that like focus truly is a limited resource or do you think it's something else? The number one mistake uh, in practicing? Yeah. Not 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 guess, like a technical like a trill or something, but just like sort of meta like the approach of it. Um, number, I, I got to think about that. O overthinking mm -hmm. something or knowing when to step back, and that when you're hitting a wall, when to just go do something else and come back with a fresh uh, perspective, and all of a sudden you'll you'll find what you were missing. Mm -hmm. you know, the first How time long? Was. Do you think someone, because th th there's a trade-off there, right? Because sometimes you hit a wall and you hit a wall and you're able to overcome it there in the moment just by taking a breath, resetting, refocusing. What do you think your advice would be for someone when they're hitting a wall for how long to try for it and what point to sort of call it quits and go have a state change and do something else? Mm, I, that's a hard, that's a hard one. You just know. I think if, if you're if you're working on a passage or a piece of music or trying to write something or or you know working on a technique and you feel like nothing is is changing, um, I don't know. It could be half an hour. It could be an, an hour. But everyone knows where they've kind of hit their their mm. limit. Um, you you have to fi figure that out for yourself and. It, it could be either taking a break, taking a walk, or just going to work on something mm. else and coming back to the first thing. Um, or, you know, if it's late at night, just go to bed. <laughs> you'll get up a little earlier and you'll have a fresher head and, and all of a sudden everything will make sense. It's happened to me many times. What so, a radical practice yeah. technique. <clears throat> go to sleep. <laughs> go to sleep, man, seriously. <laughs> right? Joe, uh, with, uh, with creativity... Do you take any steps to protect your creative space? You talk about how you have sort of like your music man cave, uh, but do you, do you take in, and that's obviously your physical space, but how do you protect your mental space to sort of keep a clean slate to create and do things like that? Um, well, uh, just trying to find a quiet place. If I'm... You mean when I'm when I'm Anytime. writing or when I'm composing? Well, okay, when being creative matters. So I'm assuming that's when you're writing, not mm -hmm. when you're necessarily like trying to like just absolutely nail the violin solo off of Baba O'Reilly, which I'm assuming is something you do when you play with the Who. <laughs> Actually, it is not. It is not the person I play in the orchestra. This is a crazy story. Um, the person that does that solo, the touring violinist, is my friend Katie Jacoby. Really, and Katie is amazing she's great and she's like my little sister and when katie was 14 her mom emailed me and said uh, katie heard about me wanted to take lessons and she lived in delaware so every sunday they would drive up from delaware to new jersey three hour two hour three hour drive and we would do like three hour lessons um starting when she was 14 and then when she was 16 she joined school of rock in philly the pilot program and one day she comes to me and goes um, you know, we're doing Bob O'Reilly and I need to learn the violin solo. Can we work on it today? I'm like, yeah, let's, let's figure out the violin solo to Bob O'Reilly. So 10 years later, she's playing the violin solo for Bob O'Reilly and I'm sitting there in the orchestra. That must be such know. an amazingly gratifying my, moment as a teacher. My work here is done. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not going to go around saying I'm playing the solo because I'm not, I'm, I, I'm happy to be there and it's a cool experience. I'm happy for her, you know, and she's been, she's done a lot of great things with her career. So yeah. 
Um, but you, what was the so, other question? Uh, you had ste- steps question. To, cre- to protect creative mind space. Um, well, not answering the phone. Mm. or it, th- That's the hard part. I'm getting notifications all the time about this, about that, um, social media. And then what angers me <laughs> and frustrates me is the – amount of platforms you have to maintain yes. now as an artist or as any entity you know because you have a podcast to promote your brand facebook twitter instagram tiktok i can go on and on and on and there's this constant list of things and hours can go by you gotta do your patreon your website your email blast this and that and there's no time to to make music i mean and then on top of that if you're if you're a, a father uh, of two and and you know and then you have gigs and a job, a day job, you know, I don't know how people manage. A lot is expected of artists these days, you know, and everyone, it makes it sound like we're, it's easy or we, it, everything is DIY, right? But there's only so many hours in the day. So that all being said, I just try to shut out the world during the designated time that I have, because I have limited time and just focus, you know, it's sometimes it doesn't work, but I really make the effort. And that, that's the key. I, you know, I turn off my phone and, you know, don't respond to emails for the, whatever that period of time is. And that, that's why I like the idea of artist mm. retreats where, you know, you're out in the woods and you can just create, you know. Do you have a time or times of day where you feel more creative in general? You know, now. <laughs> the, this time of day, I, I'm usually like, let's go, man. Let's do let's it. Do the it. morning. Just, yeah. Yeah. I like, I'm a morning guy. Have you... Which is weird. Have you ever uh, but, burned out from um, too much time spent on being creative and too much time spent on music? Um, yeah. I mean, if if I go through a period where I'm really working a lot and not sleeping much and just running around, absolutely. If I'm deep into something and it's going well and you get into mm. a groove and you know you need to finish it and you know it's going to be good and you're proud of it, time just yes. disappears, you know. Um, you forget about time and, and it goes by very fast. Um, so th- then you're, you're kind of pushed by whatever force is, is driving that creation. And, you know, that's happened to me as well. What do you think your number one piece of advice uh, for people about developing and deepening creativity would be? It's a muscle. If I go through periods where I don't write a lot um, and then I go through periods where I'm just, it's gushing mm-hmm. out of me, you know. I think just it, it, triggering it, um, just as, if I want to get into a writing zone, I'll just free write lyrics or record myself jamming and, and listen to melodies. And I call it the no ah. judgment zone. I'm just going to spew and I, and I'll worry about it later. Um, that's, that's the, the main thing. Um, and again, I get idea, a lot of ideas mm. when I'm running. Because I don't listen to ah. music when I run. I, I, I like the silence. And then I come up sometimes, it's the idle time yeah. when I come up with a melody or a hook. Or sometimes when I'll, I'll wake up and I'll have something in my head. I've written a lot of songs that way. It comes out of nowhere. I'll just dream it and I'll sing it into my phone so I don't forget it. So I have a bunch of little uh, voice uh, memos where, that I've over the years collected. <laughs> uh most of which I haven't used yet. So sometimes I'll sort through those and I'm like, oh yeah, I <laughs> forgot about this one. <laughs> and those, those are like good techniques to um, get into a writing groove. You so are very good. lucky you remember the music after you wake up. I hear music all the time in my dreams and when I wake up, it is gone. So what, well, what, it, what, <laughs> what do you think is the uh, number one mistake around trying to be creative? And if you're listening on audio, I'm doing air quotes. What do you think the number one mistake about trying to be creative is that you've learned in your life? You, the last thing you want to do is put this pressure on yourself that this has got to be the hippest thing in the world and i got to impress everybody. Uh, if you walk into the, the room when you're going to write something and with that he- cloud hanging over your head, it's gonna, you're going to crash and burn. You know, you, you got to stop thinking about how people what are th- people mm. going to think of it you know um you just it's again it goes back to self-acceptance what what an incredible message yeah. uh so far i've got a couple more we can knock these out real quick in about 60 seconds what do you say joe all right Let's do you do prefer it. to write after listening to music for inspiration or from a clean slate 
I don't have Excellent. a preference. What's your number one piece of advice for people who want to compose music or write songs? Just, do it. <laughs> just keep it going. What's the <laughs> just, number one mistake just, just you learn to avoid it. in trying to compose and write songs? The, the relentless pursuit. Oh. Of hipness. <laughs> Man, if you don't have an album called The Relentless Pursuit of Hipness, I'm just saying <laughs> that sounds like a good title. That sounds like a Yeah, jazz The Relentless movie. Pursuit of Hipness, man. <laughs> that would be a good name for a jazz um, Has yeah. performance anxiety ever threatened to impact or impacted your performance in any way? Funny, but it, it, more classical performances, which mm. I don't do that often, but when I do, that's when I get the anxiety. I'm more anxious when I know exactly yes. what I'm supposed to play. <laughs> <laughs> then when I have no idea what I'm going to play, or in some cases who I'm playing with, the, the the unknown is is more relaxing for me than the known, which is kind of backwards from a lot. Well, of people, that's interesting. That actually brings uh, brings me to uh, what is going to be my my last question for you, which is a lot of the yeah. music you play is both through composed and also have these moments of improvisation, the 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 the, the, the proggy stuff. That, 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 that I was checking out. So when you mm. have those moments where you know you have to hit certain signposts, right? And then you're going to have a jam for whatever, be it a determined number of measures or cycles, or you're going to cue the band or whatever. Do you feel a mix mm. between that sort of um, knowing that you need to have every note in place because it is a song and it sounds a certain way? Or how does that work for you? I, I love that. I gravitate towards improvisation Ooh. within structure. I love that that wonderful juxtaposition in music when it happens. So for, for me, it's it's cool. Um, and it's like, you know, you're bouncing, you're, I don't know, playing basketball, <laughs> passing this ball between every, back and forth and, and going for the, the shot. You know, it's a team effort. Everybody's tuning in and listening to each other. And that to me is exciting. Uh, it's chamber music. It's, it's the same mm. in my string quartet. And it's the same in, in my, in Stratospheres in my band. It's the same process. You're all kind of really tuning in on each other and trying to lift mm. each other up. And um, yeah. And, and yeah, there's the open solo sections. Um, and a lot of times I kind of know the what i'm gonna play but it always goes to yes you sort of have an place. outline yeah. I, i'm thinking of like john petrucci yeah. who will always have an outline of his solo yeah. especially as i'm sure yeah. you, you've experienced with the especially virtuosic sort of passages you want to have those down but what happens mm -hmm. in between those perhaps is changed out yeah yeah and the, as a result um the song is yes. never played the same way twice ever ever um I, i'm not a huge fan of songs where the guitar solo is is the same every night then again there are some iconic songs where yes. the fans know the solo <laughs> as, as well as the melodic hook so they're going to sing along with the guitar solo which is a testament to that person because they created a solo that everyone sings along with which is pretty cool but yeah i like to change things up and surprise people and i guess that's that's what uh, attracts me about progressive rock is you can have that juxtaposition and people will go along for the ride and it, it could be a little more free and wacky and atonal and whatever, or it could be very structured. Well, Joe, thank you so much for your expertise, your wisdom, your knowledge, and for your time to come hang out with me and share your experience. You can check out Joe's latest offering with uh, Rachel Flowers and Alex Skolnick, and it's a cover of Chick Corea's Spain. It's on the upcoming Joe Denizen and Stratospheris box set, double CD and Blu-ray behind the curtain, live from Prague Stock. Links to that video and performance are in the description if you are on video and in the show notes if you are on audio joe thank you so much for your time thank you so much these are great questions and and refreshing from the questions i usually wait get, wait you know, but what's your favorite song what what artist did you grow up with i'm kidding i'm <laughs> kidding he's got to go people joe thanks so much for your time <laughs> that too <laughs> thanks so much Dan. thanks for having me this was a lot of fun